look at the chat. And thank you so much to Danley Point LLC for being a cooperator with the Florida Food Policy Council. They were the ones who brought the DFAP information to the Food Policy Council and asked us to share it during these um, special edition, um, excuse me, information sessions. So today um, we have with us one of our cooperators and um, in this work, and we want to recognize some of the other cooperators in the work. Um, we specifically with the Danley, excuse me, the Danley group specifically works with the Rural Coalition and Land Loss Prevention. So I'm just going to give a little more information about the Rural Coalition. Um, as one of the most diverse of rural organizations, the Rural Coalition is an alliance of farmers, farm workers, indigenous, immigrant, and working people from throughout the Northern Hemisphere who work to develop capacities of rural organizations and people to secure systemic change in order to protect and sustain their land and their communities. Founded in 1978, the Rural Coalition has worked for 45 years to advance the interests of historically um, underserved producers and rural communities um, around and in the Northern Hemisphere. We also have um, presenting today um, the Land Loss Prevention and the Land Loss Prevention Project was founded in 1982 by the North Carolina Association of Black Lawyers to curtail epidemic land loss of Black, of, excuse me, epidemic loss of Black owned land in North Carolina. The Land Loss Prevention Project was incorporated in the state of North Carolina in 1983. The organization brought in its mission in 1993 to provide legal support and assistance to all financially distressed and limited resource farmers and landowners in North Carolina. Land loss the Land Loss Prevention Project's advocacy for financial distressed and limited resource farmers and involves action in three separate arenas, litigation, public policy, and promoting sustainable agriculture and environment. And we also have with us um, and cooperate with the Windsor Group. And the Windsor Group um, is a project lead throughout the Southeast on the DFAP project, and we'll give you more information in the chat about them. And so a little bit about us before we start with our presenters. Um, the Florida Food Policy Council creates opportunities to collaborate, celebrate, and advance equitable food policies to improve the quality of life. The Florida Food Policy Council builds on culture, builds on a culture, excuse me, of health rooted in equity through food justice by connecting the community to their food and the food system, we can place well-being at the center of every aspect of life. We are a grassroots organization and based in community engagement and action. Um, this is just one of a number of information sessions about the DFAP program, so please listen out for announcements about the other sessions upcoming and I am going to um, go ahead and start with our presenter. And excuse me, um, our presenter is Stefan Bowens. And Stefan Bowens is an attorney who works with the Land Loss Prevention Project. He's a native of North Carolina, and he was reared in Riley, North Carolina, and has served as a public interest attorney for um, the last 11, his, his last 11 years in practice. And for the last 17 years, he has worked in the private sector to enhance the lives of clients through the use of law. He has an abundance of experience in working in, in the areas of discrimination. And um, we're going to go ahead and hand it over to Stefan. Thank you so much for coming.
Well, number one, I want to thank the um, Florida Food Policy Council and particularly you, Ms. Hardison, for, for having us. Uh, with me today is Mr. Danny Bismarck Petit. Uh, and Mr. Petit and I uh, will be going through this presentation together. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna steal Mr. Uh, Bismarck's uh, thunder and uh, because he has a, a series of uh, wonderful uh, and illuminative slides uh, that he's going to provide and show to you all uh, with respect to this, this particular matter. But a little bit about me, a little bit more about me. Um, as you know, attorneys, we always like to talk about ourselves. Um, and as a practical matter, uh, I am from North Carolina. Uh, number one, as, as you have given honor, wanted to give honor to the names uh, in the tribes of the indigenous people uh, here in North Carolina um, on whose land uh, we, we sit, uh, namely Cherokee, Lumbee, Hawane, Sapani, and Tuscarora. Uh, number two, uh, just wanted to also follow up by saying that I have been engaged in the practice of law for more than 29 years. Um, my first my first position was with Legal Aid of North Carolina, where I worked with with uh, small family farmers um, in eastern North Carolina. Uh, and I can tell you one of the most rewarding things that I, I uh, experienced while working with Legal Aid. Uh, was that uh, many of my, my farm uh, families, um, they would come to me and say, I don't have money, but I, I feel like I got to give you something. So it, it wasn't unusual for us to find a note and a bushel of collard greens on the back porch of our uh, office uh, in Smithfield, North Carolina. Um, so I, I just want to share that with you, let you know that, uh, number one, I have been working with farm families for more than 29 years. I am uh, the progeny of people of the land. Um, and um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Bismarck, let him uh, introduce himself to you. And then I am going to come back and talk more specifically about discrimination, how it uh, evidences itself um, through USDA and its lending practices. Mr. Bismarck. Thank you, uh, Stefan. I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen now. Um, Erica, just let me know if you're able to uh, view it. It's all good. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, very good. All right, folks. Um, Stefan and myself have been uh, going up and down the state of North Carolina, Virginia, and uh, it's been a real pleasure and honor working with him. Um, I'm originally from Zimbabwe, Africa. Uh, my background is in economic development and technology, having started uh, companies in Southern Africa, um, has been involved in, uh, grew up in apartheid type uh, systems and uh, land issues and economic uh, development is very near and close to my heart. Um, fortunately, I had the opportunity of meeting uh, Executive Director Savvy Horn several years ago when I first moved to North Carolina, and she started introducing me to the Black farming communities uh, throughout North Carolina. And I did volunteer work and over time developed a real love for the work um, and was able to come on board with this particular project. And uh, we formed what I think is a pretty formidable team. Uh, Stefan and I, uh, we quite enjoy going out and meeting folks. Uh, we've been known to get into these meetings for about two and a half hours going back and forth. <laughs> but uh, it's the work that we love to do. And uh, just I, I hope that comes across in what we're talking about today here, because this is is serious work. And um, I'm going to open up and uh, talk a little bit about the background, the history but we have a tremendous amount of information to cover. I'm gonna limit myself to 10 to 15 minutes. And, and then I wanna turn it over to Stefan. Um, so first thing, uh, we've had a little introduction to land loss, but um, it is significant that it was one of the first organizations and uh, Stefan was actually an executive director uh, for this organization. 
uh, several years ago uh, for a period of, I believe, about, what, seven to ten years or something, and Stefan will clarify that. But um, the work that LLPP has, has been doing is significant, and so it's no mistake that uh, we're involved in this process as, as one of eight cooperators. But some of these specific legal services that LLPP has provided, and I apologize, there's a train going by. We have a train that uh, passes by this property, uh, so you may hear some very loud background noise, but that's what it, that is. Um, so LLPP has been involved in foreclosure prevention, estate and farm succession planning, evaluating and stabilizing air property, and addressing real property disputes. Also small business planning, farm leases, and bankruptcy filings for Chapter 12 and 13. Um, I'm going to do a quick program overview. Normally, this these are the areas that we cover. Um, the history, program administration, we talk about, uh, and this is, as we've been going through this program, and I've been, I just got back from Albany, Georgia, um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about how this program has been set up. There's a lot of question marks around the, um, the administration, how it's been organized, how things are being done, and so I do want to try and clarify that and shed some light on it. We'll talk about some of the specific resources that uh, we've developed. And then we'll get into the eligibility, touch on the applications. And then uh, for purposes of this presentation, uh, we're going to get right into the discrimination piece and and, uh, uh, the, and then how you can move forward uh, working with us, particularly the uh, Danley Point um, LLC. So what is DFAP 22007? So on July 7th, 2023, the United States Department of Agriculture announced that the USDA Discrimination Financial Assistance Program was open. The program was authorized by the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, IRA. And so you'll hear it referred to as IRA 22007 or DFAP. And so it is a program that makes $2.2 billion available for discrimination financial assistance that is available for farmers that can show they experienced discrimination in USDA farm loans program before January 1, 2021. So the Land Loss is a Prevention Project is working alongside eight other USDA-awarded cooperating organizations, and we are known as the cooperators, the eight cooperators. I'll list those for you shortly. Quick history. This is a stark thing. I, I just attended. I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of the participants uh, online uh, listening to the Equity Commission uh, which has currently been uh, just had a, an event last week. And one of the presenters was a Dr. Ronald uh, Rainey. And uh, this is just a stark uh, realization of what has happened um, in terms of black farms. And if you look at this number, what is incredible to see is the in the red, as you can see up on the top there, look at the number of farms and then look at what's happened in the, from 97 to 2017. You can barely make out um, the number of farms that are owned by uh, white farmer, at least black farmers and other, as they refer to it in the census. So this census shows uh, the number of farm operators out there. And in that 1997 to 2017 period, an increase of over 1 million in white farm operators. Think about that for a minute and look at how those numbers have dwindled. And so the work and, and what this project is attempting to do is one of several things, but there's a long history here. And one of the things that I've become uh, acutely aware of is the level of mistrust that has developed. But what I'm glad to say, let me say before I get into this, is uh, listening in on that equity commission um, uh, meeting, um, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised at the efforts that the USDA is undergoing right now. Uh, to really bring about change, uh, and I'll talk. I'll talk specifically about that right at the end. But uh, there is a significant amount of work. So as much as we've looked at this program, and it is extremely complex. Uh, like people like to say it's simple, but it really is not. Um, and we've done a lot of work to try and simplify that. But just very quickly, the history and context of this is this. Uh, this you know, the LLPP has been involved since the '90s, advocating. Um, and, and for the rights and privileges created within the Farm Bill for Black farmers um, to be designated as a socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher definitions, be included in the 1990 Farm Bill. 
And so right around this time of the Farm Bill change, there were several lawsuits filed against the USDA for discrimination and access to credit. And these were the Pigford one and two lawsuits, the Keep Siegel case, the Garcia and the Love uh, case. And these were filed respectively for black farmers, Native American farmers and ranchers, Latinx farmers and ranchers and women farmers and ranchers. And so there's this history of these suits being filed. But one thing I wanna make sure that we understand is that this is not a lawsuit. This is not a claims process. This is uh, financial assistance. And so when we're talking about this, we wanna make sure that you understand that it's a financial assistance program and not a lawsuit or a lawsuit settlement. Because some folks who may be familiar with the Pigford lawsuit, and we've met a lot, may think it is a farmer settlement and think it is the same claims forms process. It's not. Um, these are the same due process rights which have which have in a lawsuit. So two things that make this different than a lawsuit is that there are not no claim forms, they're application forms. The second thing is that this finance it is a financial assistance program and there is no right to appeal. Um, the program is going to be implemented in accordance with the law and it's going to be primarily implemented by administrators. And so as I mentioned, USDA is changing. In fact, uh, one of their mantras is shaping change at USDA. And um, I wanna, I'm gonna just touch on this because I believe it's, um, as we're engaging and it's our opportunity to speak with farmers or people who have an interest in this area, we kind of play a dual role. One is to have the accountability of the USDA at heart, but also to help build trust between the farmers and the communities that we're uh, attempting to serve but also it's an opportunity to feed back what's actually going on at the USDA. And so in all fairness, while we, while we might have some very harsh and, and uh, words to say, um, there are some tremendous uh, changes taking place. And uh, I was able to see some of the amazing presentations, uh, including uh, one by a one Dr. Penny Brown Reynolds, who's now the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights and the tremendous work that uh, she has been doing in that office. So I say that just to uh, say that, yes, there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, hurt in the past and the U USDA has a lot to make up. And this is the program that they're attempting to do, do so with, but um, there's still work to be done, but uh, put the work in. Uh, don't be like, there's a lot of farmers are holding back on this. And we're going to encourage you to really take on this program. But we also warn you that there is an urgency. So this program is helpful, but it does take commitment to the process. Utilize the resources, stay there, um, stay engaged. And while there has been historical challenges in the past, there are major efforts underway to address past injustices, but equally powerful forces to take whatever gains uh, made away. Very quickly, um, let's explain this because I've had a lot of questions about this. And we we try and uh, we try to get into this uh, to explain how this all works. So the the main thing here is that the there is a national the, the, sorry the USDA has hired non government organizations administrators and cooperators outside of USDA to help educate provide outreach and provide technical assistance to applicants. So the national administrator and regional hubs which you may hear about are under contract to conduct outreach assist and uh, with the financial assistance application process, process applications, manage program call centers and operate local offices. Additional outreach and uh, application support is provided by community groups, cooperators. And there are eight cooperators who are appointed by um, USDA and then a number of sub cooperators who the cooperators appoint. So at the top, we have the USDA Discrimination Financial Assistance Program. The national administrator is the Midtown Group. The two, re the regional hubs are uh, one on the Eastern region is the Windsor Group, LLCC, LLC, and then the Analytics Acquisitions Group on the Western region. The regions, and this is borrowed from a presentation by Matt Bauman that we were uh, experienced uh, about two, three weeks ago. And this is just a map that shows the breakdown. This was helpful to know which territories are which. And uh, as you can see, region one, hub one, hub two, hub three, hub four. And uh, this all takes on relevance when you see what resources are available to you. Uh, we work collaboratively. Um, and so anybody can choose who they wanna work with. 
but we've, you know, we've established our cooperator groups and each one has a certain kind of value add. Um, and as you'll see on, on our side in particular on LLPP, the value add is um, we have free legal assistance, actually lawyers working with us and uh, looking at uh, all aspects of this program. And needless to say, that help is free. There is no charge uh, for those services. And so as you have it, this is the uh, Midtown Group. I'm not gonna go into this, but I want you to pay attention to this, that they are actually involved in evaluating the applications, they're determining the eligibility, and they're also involved in making final decisions. The second thing is the analytics, the second, the regional hubs are also involved in evaluation initial eligibility and making some initial decisions. I wanna be clear that the cooperators, the community groups such as ourselves, LLPP, Rural Co, um, are not involved in that decision-making process. I wanna be very, very clear on that. And so that's why there's a big X there in terms of evaluation, initial eligibility and final decisions. Let's talk very quickly about eligibility. Um, there's a, a brochure that we've put together. Um, it's a one page brochure, both sides, we call it our trifold brochure. This is taken from that. I'm just gonna quickly touch on this and then I wanna turn it over to uh, Stefan. Um, so let me just go back here real quick. So the two, the two types, the farmer who has experienced discrimination and a farmer who has assigned or assumed a USDA farm loan and original borrower experienced discrimination on that same debt. Those are the two types of folks who can qualify for this. The time frame is that it need, the discrimination needs to have been experienced before January 1, 2021. It must be a USDA program, um, and it needs to have taken place with direct or guaranteed USD lo USDA loans, not the lender. Check out the flag guide, which we refer to throughout our documentation and other resources for more information on this. Also, there are no other estate far, uh, claims. A farmer's estate or heirs cannot file for someone deceased unless they were assigned um, or assumed um, under the conditions above. Finally, just very quickly, uh, the application. The application, there's two ways to submit the application. One is a printed application, and you can mail it in, or you can deliver it, actually three, if you walk it into an office. Um, and then the third one, which they highly encourage, and we do too, is to do an online application. The application form or the online submission through the portal is due January 13th, 2024. This includes all your supporting documentation. One of the most important things here, folks, is to tell your story. It's your narrative. Provide details. It's critical for the farmer to provide significant details. Read our burden of proof, and Stefan will touch on that explanation in the guide. The supporting documentation, uh, there's a lot that's there. We talk about uh, must documents um, and may documents, do documents that you must provide and documents that you may provide. We recommend that you only file once and remember that no appeals from decisions in the program and have all the details in the application. Um, I'm gonna transition this one, one more time. This will be the last slide I have and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Stefan. Um, to be eligible in the program, then just to summarize, you must be or have been a farmer or would be farmer. You must be or have been a participant or would be participant in farm lending. You have experienced discrimination by USDA and USDA farm lending or be a debtor with assigned or assumed USDA farm lending debt that was the subject of USDA discrimination. You must be able to verify your identity and you must provide information to substantiate the discrimination experienced. Um, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I will go back uh, on some of the stuff that we have available. But what I do want to bring up is um, Stefan's uh, slides. Give me a second here. And Stefan, um, just keep in mind, we've not touched on the application. So if you have time at the end, we'll go back to that. But uh, I'm going to transition right into the discrimination piece for you. Here we go. So while um, Danny has um, talked to giving you a, a brief overview, um, number one, I want to say again, hey, y'all. Uh, you know, I'm from the South, so I, I, I use the word y'all. Um, and 
I also want to say to you, um, as as we go through this, um, what's the end goal? Um, one of the things we talk about is uh, what is the DFAP? What is uh, IRA 22007? Well, most importantly, uh, it is just an act that was passed by Congress, and it's a subsection of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and really what it does is it is the last best chance for farmers who have been discriminated against to um, receive uh, some funding. And one of the things that I think that we didn't, and, and I think we're probably remiss, that we didn't say, well, how much money can I get? Um, the reality is that this program provides up to $500,000. And I want to say that again, up to $500,000 to each individual farmer that has been um, subjected to discrimination by USDA in its farm lending programs. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize the word farm lending programs. Okay. And we'll talk about uh, some of those programs and, um, and what they are about. So let's, let's first talk about discrimination because I think that's number one, the most important um, term that we need to look at. Um, what is discrimination? I like to keep it simple. Now there's, there are, there's a much longer um, definition, uh, but very simply discrimination is uh, defined as treating someone differently from others based on what I call an immutable characteristic. What is an immutable characteristic? It's a characteristic you can't change. What's a what's a particular characteristic you can't change? Oh, maybe my skin color, my race, right? Uh, I was born black. I'm going to be black until the day that I die. Can't change that one bit. And you know what? I'm proud of it. And having said that, um, there are many people who have been discriminated based on their race. Now, is race the only way um, you can qualify if you've been the subject of discrimination? The answer is no. Dana, can you go to the next slide, please? So who are the classes of people that are protected from discrimination? People who are being discriminated based on race or color. People who have been discriminated based on religion, sex. Oh, wait a minute now. Um, sex, at, at, especially in recent um, recent years, has been a hot topic in the civil rights community. So sex means, number one, um, can you be discriminated uh, against because you're a woman? Absolutely. Can you be uh, discriminated against based on your sexual orientation? Absolutely. Um, can you be discriminated against uh, based on the fact that you're pregnant? Absolutely. And can you be discriminated against based on your gender ID, ID identity? I'm sorry. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, national origin. Can you be discriminated against because you are, are of a particular uh, descent? Let's say you, your family uh, uh, is from Mexico. Absolutely. Um, disability. Disability is a big one. Um, disability touches on everybody um, of any race, creed, color, uh, religion. Um, and so I often get the question, well, y'all only, y'all only represent black folk. No, we represent all folk. And, um, disability, um, provides a mechanism, um, for all people to, who have been subjected to discrimination because of their, um, disability, um, to receive some, uh, some benefit. Now I'll just give you a quick aside about disability. Uh, we met this wonderful gentleman uh, when Danny and I were uh, in Virginia at Virginia State. He was a white male. He was probably about, uh, I'd say about 58 years old. And um, he was blind. And USDA, he went in and said, uh, I need some assistance. I want to I want to purchase a farm. I'm a veteran. Da, 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 da. USDA looked at him and said, you're blind. You can't get a loan and told him to get out the office. Now, uh, 
I don't know about you, but that might be an instance of discrimination based on disability. Age, uh, specifically if you're uh, older than 40, you can be discriminated against. And of course, you can be discriminated against by genetic information. Now, genetic information isn't one of those areas that typically uh, we're going to see in this particular uh, program, but uh, I put it in there because obviously as technology changes, uh, it is important for you all to know all the areas in which discrimination can occur. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Burden of proof on the, under the um, Inflation Reduction Act, Section 22007. What is the burden of proof? Is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Is it a preponderance of the evidence or is it substantial evidence? Well, beyond reasonable doubt, as probably many of you know, is a criminal um, criminal requirement under the law. So certainly we're not in a criminal setting. We're not even in court. So we know that beyond reasonable doubt, A is incorrect. What about a preponderance of, ev of evidence? That usually means that by the greater weight of evidence, i.e. 51 to 49, I've proved that um, that the discrimination has occurred. Uh, sounds pretty good. Um, in this case, it's not the right answer, but it is the correct answer if we were in a civil trial and we were actually in court. So that leaves C, substantial evidence. Can we go to the next slide, please? Substantial evidence. So substantial evidence is such evidence that a reasonable person would find that discrimination occurred. All right. Um, is there anybody on this call that doesn't believe that they are a reasonable person? If you if you don't think you're a reasonable person, speak up. All right, hearing nobody, um, then I, I think you got the standard. The standard in this case is what a re reasonable person would believe is sufficient evidence to show that discrimination occurred. Next slide, please. So who is eligible? Farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners. Let me say that again. Farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners are eligible if they were discriminated against by um, a Farmers Home Administration, formerly FMHA, or Farm Service Agency, which is the current name of the uh, organi organization. Um, official in lending prior to January 1 of 2021. Next slide, please. So we know what discrimination is. Discrimination is someone was, someone was treated better than I, I was. Typically that individual is a white male. We typically call that individual a similarly situated, specifically identified uh, individual. You all don't need to know that. Um, the, 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 the part that you really need to know is that um, I was a farmer. I was discriminated against because of my, um, because of the color of my skin or because um, I had a disability. And I know this because Farmer X um, got a loan when I didn't. So we need to know, number one, what discrimination is, but we also need to know, more importantly, what types of loans are eligible. And the types of loans that are eligible are farm ownership loans. Um, that's when you go in and you ask for an application for a loan and you want to buy a farm or a portion of a farm. Um, or an operating loan. What's an operating loan? An operating loan is a loan that um, is uh, that you you seek to get so that you can get the crops out, the crops in, the crops to market, um, and you are able to retain your profit. In other words, you're buying the seed or the feed that you need in order to uh, either get the crops uh, growing um, and or um, to get the, if it's cattle, get the cattle uh, growing uh, to feed them and fatten them up uh, for uh, sale in the market. 
And so it's like an annual uh, uh, annual, annual loan that you need to uh, operate your farming operation. Youth loans. Youth loans are very important. Those are typically smaller loans, um, usually in the range of, uh, of five to twenty thousand um, dollars. But those are loans that are available to uh, get young people interested in farming. Um, and youth loans uh, go up to the age of 20. Um, economic emergency loans, EE loans, um, just what it says. And that's one thing I love about USDA, the types of loans they offer uh, and the types of loans that are eligible are somewhat self-explanatory. There's been an economic emergency in your area um, and um, the USDA has made resources available for farmers in a particular area. Let's say there's been um, an issue where um, the the uh, where you where um, the economy has has taken a downturn, um, and for that reason, USDA um, is. Um, USDA will move it forward. Um, again, uh, there are a number of other types of loans. Uh, you can see soil and water. Um, there's also emergency loans that are usually result of natural di disasters, uh, softwood timber loans, uh, and farm storage facility loans. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, what are what are um, the, the examples of discrimination? The typical examples of discrimination are um, that you you went in and the most common ones are, I went in, I tried to get an application for a loan and the, farm, the person at the FSA office refused to give me a loan. Another typical example is I went in, uh, they gave me an application, I completed it, um, but I got the loan um, late or I sought an application for loan servicing um, and it wasn't processed until after they already started, they already foreclosed on my on my farm. Um, next slide, please. So what do you have to prove um, for discrimination? You have to prove or provide documentation such as deeds, deeds of trust, and promissory notes, which is establish that um, that you had a loan or a lending relationship, or you attempted to have a loan or a lend lending or trade, uh, relationship. What other type of documentation can you get? You can and you should provide, and and throughout the the forty page application, it is going to ask you for affidavits. In other words, written statements from, uh, in, in this case, non-family members um, who can verify that the events that you describe are, are uh, in fact occurred. Um, what other documentation is necessary or that you can provide? Tax records, maps, newspaper clippings. In other words, I went in to buy the Jones Farm and, uh, in 1988. Well, I didn't get, they didn't give me an application. They refused to give me an application, but what other evidence can I show? Well, I can also provide an affidavit from my friend who went with me to the Farm Service Agency office, but I can also provide a copy of a newspaper clipping uh, from 1988 showing um, in the local uh, newspaper that the Jones Farm was in fact for sale uh, at the time. Um, and then the most important thing that you need to provide is your personal story of discrimination. In other words, your narrative. You know, how did it occur? What impact did it have on you? And what were your damages? Um, what do you get if you were a successful applicant? You get up to $500,000. Um, now, having said all of that, uh, what I'm going to do, because I know that was a kind of quick run through uh, what I'd like to do, if I could, is open it up for questions um, and see if anyone has any specific questions about the program. 
Um, I can tell you one of the most important things to look at is looking at either A, I tried to apply for one of the approved types of loans, or B, I tried to apply, provide, apply for loan servicing. Um, now, what is loan servicing? Loan servicing is when you already have an existing loan with USDA um, and you are a delinquent or you may be delinquent for some reason um, and you're seeking assistance um, from USDA and that assistance can come in the form um, if you're not yet delinquent, uh, you will receive what's called primary loan servicing, where you would have the opportunity to get assistance with respect to um, getting uh, a loan modification or a debt write-off or some other action um, before USDA declares you in default. Once you go into default, the only thing you're eligible for is what's called um, um uh, it's called preservation loan servicing. And in pre preservation loan servicing, it, it means what it says. You're, you're literally just trying to save your home and uh, whatever portions of the farm um, you can save. Other uh, typical examples of discrimination um, seen by USDA are, um, are for example, um, where USDA run, used to run a program called Dollars. And it's a computer generated program where it would see if you uh, could basically what's called cash flow. In other words, do you have a workable budget that shows that you can repay your debt in a, in, uh, a reasonable period of time? Um, and what would happen is the USDA officials would change the numbers that you provided um, and make your income um, less so that uh, you wouldn't have a po positive outcome on the computer program. And that was another form of discrimination. Um, let's see, I was gonna check very quickly um, to see um, if there are some questions um, uh, with respect to uh, are there questions that uh, people may have? I was looking in the, the uh, box uh, to see if the chat box to see if there are some questions. Um, Danny, can you um, look and see if there see if there are any in there? And if not, um, we I'm happy to take some questions um, on online live. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, for giving us this overview. It was really, really great. Um, what I'm going to ask because is that if Danny can stop the screen share, I'm not sure if he needs to go back. Great, great, great. Thank you, Danny, for doing that. And then if anyone would like to come off of mute and ask a question, or you can put the question in the chat and someone will read the question from the chat. And um, if we don't have any questions, um, I'll ask that our board chair and ED, Erica Hall, um, say a few words. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up. And like I said, if you have a question and you're in, you're participating or in the audience, please go ahead and just come off of mute. You can show your video if you want and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Well, thank you all. If there's no uh, further questions, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for that great presentation from the Land Loss Prevention Group. Thank you to our co-host, Dan Lee Point. Thank you to our host, uh, Erica Zenzele Hardison, and our board of directors, Anthony Oliveri, Stacey Brown. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We will continue to have these. We will continue to share. Thank you to our Danley Point team, some of who are on the call, Bakari, Cheryl, if one of you'd like to say anything on behalf of Danley Group, please feel free to come off mute. 
We will share all the information, share the documents. I've uploaded quite a few links in the chat. Um, Cheryl, would you like to say a few words? I just want to thank you for the presentation from the Land Loss Prevention Project and also thank the Florida Food Policy Council for hosting these food forums. If you want to get more information, um, you can contact us or uh, send your information to us by email. You can easily reach us at danleypoint at gmail.com. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Please remember the Florida Food Policy Council is a volunteer run organization and any donations or sponsorships help us to continue these type of programs. So we put our link in the chat as well as our website. And with that, I'll uh, send it over to our other board vice chair and board member Zinzele Erica Hardison to go ahead and close us out. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Okay, um, thank you, thank you everyone. And we appreciate you all coming today. Um, I think everything has been said. So I am just going to wish everyone a wonderful week and we hope to see you all back. Um, another time, um, you can find information about the food forums on our website and on our Facebook, and we hope you will come again. Have a great afternoon and a wonderful week, everyone.